Marietta Burdick received her BA in art history from Pratt Institute in 2018. She studied abroad in Pratt and Venice in 2017 and returned to Venice the following year in 2018 as the program assistant. So she had two summers in Venice. During her time studying and working in Venice, Marietta developed an interest in the Venetian Renaissance painter, Jacopo Tintoretto, and wrote her undergraduate thesis on that artist's enormous choir paintings located in the church of Santa Maria del Orto, working closely with me. She currently works in art communications and public relations at the at Rice, Rice Associates. Um, sorry, developing community, the light is fading here. Um, developing communication strategies for clients, including the Frick Collection, the Denver Art Museum, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. Um, Marietta's research involves um, iconographical um, study and a good deal of depth, which involved a lot of reading in Italian. So um, this was very ambitious. Marietta was born and raised in New Hampshire and lives in Brooklyn, New York. I am delighted to introduce Marietta Burdick. Thank you for the introduction, Diana. Um, I'm excited to speak to you all today about Tintoretto's paintings in the Church of the Madonna del Orto. I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> you all see my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. okay, so over the course of research and writing, Diana was of course my very dedicated advisor and I'll always be thankful to her and to Joe for introducing me to Venice and making my time there so rich and meaningful. So thank you to you both and thank you for the entire team for organizing such an incredible program today. I'll begin by giving a little background to explain why these paintings interested me and then move into a discussion about their subject matter, composition and patronage. While studying and later working in Venice, I grew an appreciation for Tintoretto, <clears throat> whose paintings are located in churches and museums all throughout the city. As a painter, he has a distinct and powerful style. And I think a lot of audiences like me are intrigued by his work. Tintoretto was born in 1519, which means last year was the 500th anniversary of his birth. And I was lucky enough to go back to Venice last summer to give a lecture about his work on site to Pratt and Venice students, which was a very special experience. Tintoretto is considered one of the great figures of the Venetian Renaissance. He was truly a Venetian in the sense that he lived in Venice his whole life. And as far as we know, he left only once. He was known for the speed with which he painted and for his bold brush strokes and dramatic use of light and dark. And he's especially appreciated for his ability to powerfully depict biblical narratives in a way that all audiences could understand and feel moved by. After spending two summers in Venice with the program and seeing Tintoretto's work throughout the city at very well-known places like the Doge's Palace and the Scuola di San Rocco, I was intrigued to find two incredible and enormous works by Tintoretto in the church of the Madonna del Orto in the neighborhood called Canareggio in the north of the city near the Jewish quarter where I happened to be living that second summer. In doing further research, I was surprised to find that these paintings were not only undiscovered by many tourists and visitors, but also relatively under-researched by scholars. These paintings are also intriguing because of their unique personal relationship to Tintoretto. Madonna del Orto was his neighborhood church, and he knew that while painting these works, he would be buried beside them, where he remains today. There are a total of eight paintings by Tintoretto in the church of the Madonna del Orto, but my research and our talk today focuses on the two paintings on the side altars that face one another, as well as the four virtues installed in the Gothic arching in the apse between them. We have no documents that provide us with an exact date of these paintings. 
The scholarly consensus is that the canvases were executed around 1562 when Tintoretto was 43 years old at the height of his career. According to Tintoretto's primary biographer, Carlo Ridolfi, uh, Tintoretto approached the secular canons of San Giorgio and Alga, who were the group of monks that oversaw this church, and proposed the commission himself, offering to complete the paintings for 100 ducats, which was just enough to cover the price of his materials. On the left side altar, we have the Adoration of the Golden Calf, a depiction of the Old Testament story of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments from God on top of Mount Sinai. Below him are his people, the Israelites, um, who are in the midst of worshiping a golden calf. I'll describe further in a moment. Across from Moses on the right side, we have the Last Judgment, which is the apocalyptic end time referenced in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament and describes the second coming of Christ when everyone's souls are judged and individuals either ascend to heaven above or are banished to hell below. Christ is shown at the top with the lily of mercy and a sword of vengeance. And in between these enormous paintings, we have the cardinal virtues. In order from left to right, there's temperance, justice, prudence, fortitude, and faith is the figure in the middle, not a cardinal virtue and not attributed to Tintoretto. Part of what's so captivating about these works is their enormity. They're each 45 feet high and they remain to this day where they were originally installed. My talk is going to focus first on the adoration of the golden calf and Moses, and then we'll touch on the last judgment and the four virtues in discussing why Tintoretto chose to group these paintings and how his patrons and the larger religious context in which he was working informed their creation. The Adoration of the Golden Calf describes a moment in the book of Exodus when Moses, called by God, leads his people out of Egypt where they've been living as slaves under the oppressive rule of the Pharaoh. They're journeying for days in the desert when Moses is called by God to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. The, this transaction is a pivotal moment because the commandments form the basis for Jewish law and state God's universal standard of right and wrong. What I love most about this painting is the way Tintoretto translates this pivotal moment by depicting Moses as a beautiful body of pure light, like he's been literally transformed by this interaction with God. Tintoretto communicates this transformation by mirroring the face of God with the face of Moses. God flies down with tablets in hand in this turbulent swirling body of angels, and Moses is translucent and transfixed. It's striking the way that Tintoretto depicts Moses' figure as unfinished and almost sketch-like, like he's in the act of becoming. Because Moses is on Mount Sinai for so long, his people get tired and they get bored and they give up on him and they give up on God. And they decide to build a golden calf at the base of the mountain and they dance and they party around it. But what's important to point out, of course, is that the second commandment forbids the Israelites from making a graven image of God or worshiping a false idol. So just as Moses is receiving the divine law, the Israelites are in the act of breaking it. Tintoretto depicts these two moments happening simultaneously, but in the Bible, they occur as separate events. And most of Tintoretto's contemporaries who depicted this narrative chose to show these events separately or in isolation or in different moments. Ghiberti, for example, shows Moses receiving the tablets on top of Mount Sinai while the Israelites weep and wail in shame below him after they've committed the sinful act, not during it. While Zeloti depicts Moses about to throw the tablets on the ground in anger after he discovers what the Israelites have done. But Tintoretto chose to pair these scenes in one composition, partly as a practical decision to fill an extremely large canvas, of course, but also to dramatically juxtapose the creation of divine law with sin and create a warning for churchgoers against worshiping false idols which was part of an ongoing religious debate during Tintoretto's lifetime. It's easy to see the connections between the adoration of the golden calf and the last judgment. Moses and the creation of divine law correspond with Jesus and the faithful ascending to heaven, while the sinful Israelites correspond to the damned below. 
While the narrative and iconographic connections between these paintings are clear, it's unusual to see these two well-known biblical scenes paired together. To help us understand why these paintings are paired, we must of course look at them within the context of the religious debates going on in the 16th century in Europe concerning religious artwork. This is the time of the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, and there was concern that people were literally worshiping at artworks as idols in place of God, rather than using them as visual aids to connect with God. So we see a direct allusion to that debate with these paintings, which serve as a warning to worshipers about idolizing artwork instead of God. In my research, I found it surprising that there was relatively little discussion about the role that Tintoretto's patrons who commissioned and paid for these works would have had in determining the artist's choice of subject and composition. Some scholars describe these paintings as the artist's personal response to the religious debates of his time, but of course artists during the Renaissance were not paid to paint simply what they wanted. Things like subject matter, composition, and materials were often dictated by the patrons who paid for these works. Tintoretto was commissioned to create these paintings by the secular canons of San Giorgio and Alga, who I had mentioned previously. This was a group of very devout men involved in monastic reform in the 15th and 16th centuries. Although Tintoretto proposed this commission, his patrons would have surely dictated their subject matter, especially because these are enormous paintings in the most central location of their church. In delving deeper into the history of Tintoretto's patrons, I came across a prominent religious theologian and a founding member of the secular canons of San Giorgio and Alga named Lorenzo Giustiniani. Giustiniani was a formidable figure in the canon's history. He was their leading intellectual force and were able to see direct connections between his religious writings and Tintoretto's program of paintings. For example, Giustiniani wrote about the importance of the four virtues, which were at this time part of um, an ongoing debate around good works and salvation. Some people thought you needed only faith in God in order for salvation, which is a belief that Martin Luther and most Protestants held during this time and advocated on behalf of. Others, predominantly Catholics, like the priests who commissioned Tintoretto's paintings, argue that faith in God and doing good things, like giving to the poor, for example, were together necessary for salvation. The four virtues represent good works because you have temperance, justice, prudence, and fortitude, and these all correspond to one's personal actions. And if we observe closely, we're able to see that the virtues are in dialogue with Moses and the Israelites and the Last Judgment. Um, the gaze of prudence here is directed toward the painting of Moses and serves to highlight the virtues derived from the story of Exodus, such as Moses's ability to uphold the law and govern his people. The figure of temperance is opposed to vices such as drunkenness and excessive luxury, both of which are in display in the Israelites. As would be expected, the gaze of justice, who moderates the use of wealth, is in the direction of the last judgment. And finally, fortitude could allude to the patience of God and Moses in the face of the rebellious Israelites. Furthermore, in his writings, Giustiniani discusses the importance of divine law, referring directly to stone tablets and warns against fetishizing material wealth, which of course we see the Israelites doing as they worship this golden calf. So while the religious writings of a man working 150 years before Tintoretto may seem trivial in comparison to these dramatic oversized paintings, it serves as an important reminder that art, especially in the time of the Renaissance, was not produced at the whim of the artist. It's in dialogue with the beliefs of its patrons and reflective of the larger intellectual and cultural debates of their time. That concludes my talk and thank you all for listening. Bravo. Questions from Marietta are welcomed. Uh, you can, yeah. That's good. So I saw. Are there questions showing up? Dave? Not yet, but um, maybe people ne might need a, a minute or two just to type. Okay. Well, um, I would just I was just sort of ask one 
connecting thing that I'm, I know uh, I know Marietta can respond to. I'm not seeing Marietta now, but um, but um, yeah, the connection between Giustiniani's writings and the um, and the canons of San Giorgio and Alga, who were the patrons, of course, he was someone that they were studying, right? I'm trying to see, and who was important in their theological tradition. Right, can you see me, Diana? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, hi. Yeah. Yes, right. so he was a founding member of this monastic order. Um, so definitely, a, a, um, they were aware of his works and, and the monks at the Madonna del Orto had a, a library that um, held many of his writings. So we know that they were reading Justiniani and we knew that it's very likely this informed their, their program of paintings as a result. Yeah, and I think there wasn't there something that came out in your in your thesis about um, him in Giustiniani's writings actually pairing the Sermon on the Mount with the Last Judgment. Maybe it was in one of his own sermons or something like that. It, I believe that came through in your thesis somewhere. So that was, I mean, there was, there or, was, a, I mean, it, it got complicated in terms of like patronage and tracking letters. And there was a lot of hypothesizing that I didn't, want to include today, but um, he connects, that connection was found in, in a letter of a possible patronage, the Contarini family, who, who one art historian hypothesized paid for these works. Um, but it, it seemed a little tangential to my talk today, so I didn't bring it up, but there, but there, but the, his, his writings about the four virtues is what connects the the scenes together. So I mean, he does reference them all in his writings, but but I think you're thinking of the Contarini letter that okay. that includes them. Okay. Yeah, so, Diana helped me translate numerous Italian texts for this paper, so she's well informed also on this. Do we have questions from other people? We do. We have a question from Joe. Um, could Marietta talk a bit about the format of the compositions of the two main paintings? They're so distinct in comparison to, say, Tintoretto's Paradiso in the, Do in the Doge's Palace. Sure. Great question. Thank you, Joe. Well, I guess we should just look at them together. So one, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we can look at them side by side first. Okay, so in terms of composition, we can see that it, the composition is dictated by the size of the canvas, um, which you know was is is put together in parts because it's so large. And there was actually this unique pulley system installed during Tintoretto's lifetime to to install these works. Um, so a lot of labor went into bringing these into the church. Um, well, so in terms of composition with the adoration of the golden calf, there's this clear divide between Moses and the Israelites with these dark stormy clouds dividing the campus and giving a clear, I mean, the canvas and giving a clear, um, giving the viewer a clear understanding of, of these separate scenes, I guess. Um, you know, the use of light here is is actually what I explored a lot in my paper. Um, but it's like it serves as a metaphorical tool, like a visual aid to 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 draw your eye to Moses, of course. Um, the last judgment I focus less on, but I mean, it reminds us all of like a Bosch painting. It's so full of bodies and it's dramatic. And if you get really close to it, which you can at the church, of course, um, it's incredibly graphic and detailed in in these skeletons and bodies and chaos in hell and it's harder of course to see the bodies at the top but um it's 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 a dramatic painting in in its level of detail and motion um yeah i'm i'm pa i'm painting a very broad description here for you all but i think it's worth looking taking a moment to look a little closer at them because they really are incredible and full and full of information um All right. Are there other questions for Marietta in the chat? Uh, Go ahead. Yes, I think there's one from um, Jesse. Have the colors shifted at all? Um, for example, faded small? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so the um, part of the reason I focused my like visual analysis, but also like iconographic analysis on the adoration of the golden calf is because it's in better shape than the last judgment. So it appears more like it would have in Tintoretto's lifetime. The last judgment is, um, I, I mean, I believe it's because the Moses painting was cleaned more recently. Um, but the last judgment is darker than it would have appeared in Tintoretto's lifetime. So there has been, of course, change over time. Um, but the adoration is more as it would have appeared in Tintoretto's lifetime. Yeah, Joyce Plesters did a, um, a study of them um, in the 1980s, I believe, mm -hmm. where she looked at, at the conservation of them at that time. Um, and, the, and the last judgment, Marietta, is right. It's, it's, more, it's more heavily painted and harder to read. And that was one of their observations at the time. And we do know that the, um, because Tintoretto used dark grounds, often his blues fade in. And so you're probably seeing less blue, especially in the last judgment than you would have initially. So you know, Marietta's thesis was mostly on the iconography, which was, which was her focus. But yes, there's a good deal of background information on that. Other questions? Actually, we're ready to, um, almost ready to wrap up. Did Sophia, did you have a question for Marietta? Did I see something? Victoria Victoria has a question. Um, do the commissions for these paintings specify any pigments or materials or was that outside the scope of your research? Good question. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so I think what's sort of compelling about these works is despite their size and the fact that they're still where they were installed today, there's very little information about them at all. Um, in terms of the commission, like we have no records recording the details of the commission. So it's outside of my research, but the answer is no, because I, 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 don't, I don't believe we have records to show, but this is also Diana's expertise and um, like materials and pigments. I mean, it, pro it, it often was during this time, there often what were specifications about what sorts of pigments artists would use um, because the patrons were paying for them. So they wanted to have that say. Um, but no, in this case, no, not that I know of. And in, in general, um, Tintoretto mixed his pigments more than some of his contemporaries like Titian or, or Veronese or back to Bellini. And, uh, they would make their pigments more in clear layers. When we look at cross sections from The Last Judgment, some have been published, there, there's, he, used, he mixed his pigments on the canvas. And I do think that means that sometimes his colors, as Jesse is guessing, don't, um, don't remain as much as they were in the 16th century as say the examples by Titian. Um, we know, I know that's the case in the case, in these case of the Paradiso in Venice because that was being, that was being cleaned. What our first time that the Vat and Ven, Pratt and Venice program got involved with in really getting excited about materials and techniques and conservation was um, 1989 and they were cleaning that. And so we were invited to go look at it. We all went, the painters, the artists, the art historians, we all went and saw it under conservation. And one of the issues was that the blues had faded in and could not be brought back to their original color. And he was using mainly azurite, not lapis lazuli, which is better in terms of preservation. Um, I think that's published too. So if there are not more questions, I think we should thank Marietta for a wonderful presentation. And for getting into that, I, I really, I was very impressed with what she did because she, she got into all this discussion in mostly Italian um, publications. About <laughs> Thanks to you. Iconography. Yeah, but you found them, the iconography of, the, uh, of those paintings, which sort of everyone would say, oh, it's Golden Calf and his Last Judgment. Yeah, but that was an unusual pairing. And she got into the, the background for that. Um, so, brava. Also, I should have mentioned in the beginning that she gave a talk in person 
in uh, C2 in 2019, and that was really part of our celebration too. She came back to Venice um, for a third time in 2019 and hung out with Sophia and um, gave this wonderful talk on site. So, um, you know, so that was that was an, another event of 2019 and the celebration. So, brava. So, 